Um, my name is Steve Ryan. I work for Arizona State University. Uh, I work for very specifically Arizona State University's Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering. Uh, we are a really, really large college campus. Um, the oops, well, let's do this here. Yeah, um, I started working for ASU Engineering in about 2016 as a developer force of one. <laughs> um, ASU is primarily a Drupal forward uh, campus, uh, but ASU Engineering has a subset of websites that are built entirely in WordPress, and my job is to make sure that they're all functional on brand and do all the things that happen at central IT just within ASU Engineering. Um, I work on a marketing communications team uh, and uh, the most elegant way that I can say what I do is that I work for ASU Engineering. I'm an engineer for ASU Engineering, working with engineering faculty and staff to engineer other engineers. <laughs> uh, we just try to make sure that the products that we put forward are representative of the school and do all the things you guys are used to doing. I don't need to tell you what all that's about. Um, more about where I work, we're the largest, most comprehensive engineering program in the United States. Uh, scale and size is sort of appropriate, 31,000 students in fall of 2023. Uh, we have 25 undergraduate programs, 48 graduate programs, about 350 faculty within ASU Engineering doing every engineering discipline that you can think of, and probably some that I can't name because they are inventing it as we speak. So <laughs> it is um, a, a very large and very comprehensive sort of place to work. The website that I'm going to be talking about today is forge.engineering.asu.edu. And again, I will not begrudge you if you take out your cell phones or laptops and click along with that particular website URL right at the moment. I did a halfway decent job of putting some screenshots of that URL in here, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about the process that, that went on behind the scenes and not really just showcase what's on the web. So feel free to, to click on forge.engineering.asu.edu. Um, throughout the deck, I will also have some links that go out to the different resources that we're using, including the, the uh, child theme, which is on GitHub, if you want to study it and do whatever you want to do with it. Um, Forge.engineering.asu.edu is a representation of this thing that we call the Forge Expo. The Forge Expo is a uh, once a semester uh, representation of student work. It's a combination of about five or six different programs that are all sponsoring student um, student research, all coming together at once so that the students that are researching can share their results with one another and get interested in some other engineering things. That's really mostly about student networking and making sure that the students can connect with other people who may be studying sort of the same thing, but with a different twist or have a different mentor that's attacking the same problem from a different way. So, it's really a big uh, a big student expo event. Um, we get together and they show off their projects. They talk about what they built. They talk about what they're building. Uh, every year I go to the Forge Expo, I learn a whole bunch of new stuff. It makes for really interesting trivia where I can all of a sudden talk about nanotechnology or machine learning or all of the other fun engineering things that are happening in this space. So uh, it's usually about 80 to 120 students per expo. Um, it's about the size of the room that we're talking about. It's it usually takes up a space that's it's about the size of this room plus the size of the sponsor room in the back, just full of people talking. So the reason that I wanted to bring this website, forge.engineering.asu.edu, to uh, WP Campus is an example of what you can do with WordPress. It was really about student work and really the journey that we took to sort of get there. Um, I will not say that forge.engineering was like an intentional website that we built, we're like, we're going to do this right now. That wasn't how this happened. It was more of a journey that we took with a, 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 a print to digital conversion that just sort of grew organically into this crazy like representation of what is happening with student research on campus, which is really cool. So we learned a lot about it. It is one of our flagship projects that I show off to people at the university who don't really like WordPress. But <laughs> as a, as a rep presentation of what WordPress can actually do if you do it right, right? if you're doing things in the right way. Um, so to kind of detail and to dig into the context a little bit, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the data model that is running behind this, like kind of what that looks like. Also, uh, maybe some tips and tricks about how to have a conversation with people about what that looks like. Um, some of the site features that we built into it, some of the things that we sort of bolted on to solve problems as we built this thing. Um, how we adapted uh, the website to overcome a couple of challenges that have happened in its lifetime, and then you know, kind of the benefits of, of 
uh, why we under why, why we still put a whole bunch of effort and and uh, uh, whole bunch of effort and energy into building this. Okay, so what you are looking at here is the sole representation of student work that happened in 2014. This was a print uh, uh, piece that our marketing and communication team put out in 2014 that represents all of the projects that happened at this particular symposium. Um, it is, it was about 64 pages or so that looked very much like this, um, sort of representative of the class of 2014, 2015, maybe. <laughs> uh, you can see how styles have changed, right? Um, and the the pages actually in this book kind of look like this. We we kind of like it was uh, a good record, right? Like if you if you did this presentation, if you did the symposium, if you were there presenting a work, you got your name and a synopsis of the thing that you presented along with like your graduation date. It was a good sort of piece to capture like your involvement in that, in this particular process, right? But it's not the most engaging thing in the world and it was really big. Like as the symposium grew, this publication grew from, you know, like the 12 to 16 page range all the way out to like 64. And in, in the time frame that I'm gonna talk about, we were actually debating an 85 page or 80, 86, it was whatever, whatever is evenly divisible by four, 80 something pages of nothing but this, right? It looks like giant yearbook of of, present, of people presenting projects, right? Um, the lady on the screen is named Stephanie Maybe She used to work for ASU Engineering. She now works for the University of Delaware. I think Vicky and Stephanie might also be listening. So hi, miss you guys both. Um, uh, I asked Stephanie for like uh, an opinion about why we wanted to change the the print publication from what you saw on the screen to what I'm about to show you. And her words actually helped write this whole thing. So really, the publication was a good keepsake for the student presenters and for Mr. Fulton, who is the you know the endowment of our school and sponsored all of this to happen. But it didn't really do a good job of driving attendance at the at the event itself right they couldn't show it to somebody in advance and expect somebody to like engage in it real quick right um and it, it so it opened the door to doing something different with the print piece to like really move it from a place that was uh, uh like from from something that was more of a memento of what happened to actual information for like what was happening like that was the the emphasis there information is more than a memento so in 2017, this is what our print publication became. Um, we had we, we dropped almost every bit of the formatting that you saw in those pages, and we did a whole lot of emphasis on producing better content. We put resources and time and energy into um, setting up lab uh, photo shoots, We're featuring students and student mentors and the projects they were actually working on, very action-oriented, great photography comes out of this event all the time. We at the same time, took the information that was presented in that yearbook format down the columns, and now you see little tiny synopsises of people that are there, but you're noticing you're missing a whole lot of the details there, right? The profiles information is gone, their abstracts are gone, it has a record of them being there, but we don't know like sort of why. <laughs> that that all sort of uh, disappeared when we when we changed the format. So there were some good things and bad things, right? Like we can all of a sudden spotlight a particular um, a particular project. That's what happened to uh, David here on the left. Like we went and took a good picture of him doing his actual research and really, you know, captivating, engaging moment. Talks a little bit more about him in detail, but then, you know, everybody else gets sort of a synopsis of what happened there. So when we made this conversion from, from print A to print B, right? I approached Stephanie and I said, hey, we're losing a bunch of the information that was in the print publication that might be important. <laughs> I didn't want the information to just sort of go away. And it was, you know, basically in in danger, I guess, a little bit of sweeping it under the rug. Like it, it would have been a lot less work if we had just decided, yeah, we don't need any of that anymore. Like I don't really care like what happened with each particular student's abstract. I don't really care what their impact statements are. I don't really care who mentored the projects. It doesn't really matter. Like if, you know, all of the student information can be like whatever we can put in that little blurb is all we're going to keep track of from that point forward. And I didn't. Like it didn't make a ton of sense to me because I knew that at some point we might want to know about like what happened in the past. And I didn't want to lose the information, right? So I stepped up, I approached Stephanie, I said, hey, 
let's try to make a website that had at least all of the information that was in previous print publication and do something fun with it. So that was the synopsis of that. It was more like a, hey, let's grab this moment. Let's see if we can throw something together. It really was like a three week project in its initial form. So I took CSV files. I jumped everything together and then kind of jumped on the project and dropped everything and made something happen. Right. So when we were doing the development, and this is WordPress entering the picture now, I knew that we needed to do four things. One of them was data retention, just keep the depth of the profile and project information that we had in print, keep it going on the web. That's where it made the most sense. There's no you know, cost of printing uh, additional things. We also had an opportunity to do something fun with, um, with the timing of everything. So the print publication was a good map of what had happened in like one space of time, excuse me. But with the web and digital presentation, you can actually tell that story over a longer period of time. So all at once, we got a chance to expose not only like what was happening in that moment, we could also go back and see trends of what was happening over the last uh, three or four publications or three or four symposium. It's really cool, right? We definitely had uh, an excuse to use the new artwork <laughs> um, on our website as well as in print, like all of those beautiful pictures that we were suddenly taking and spending a lot of time to curate. I wanted to make sure that our website actually had those information in it. And then the responsibilities to like curate all of that information fell on like one person. Like it was one person's job to like go out and grab all the headshots of all the students to like proofread all the abstracts to like deal with the impact statements to make sure that everybody was in alphabetical order, that their names were right, that their graduation dates were right. And by putting a lot of this into WordPress and exposing a lot of it digitally, <coughs> well, excuse me. We could all of a sudden share those responsibilities with other people that were uh, adjacent to our department. So it wasn't just our department's responsibility to sort of keep this up and manage the information anymore, which is kind of nice. All right. So time to WordPress all the things. There's also time to cough drop all the things. So hang on a second. Yeah, I, it's, you know, I'm from Arizona and they have this thing here that's like green and, and it's like really big, shades you from the rain. And they have this stuff called grass and flowers. We don't have any of that, like where I'm from. So <laughs> it's dirt and like dust and rocks and cactus, but none of this like allergy stuff. So yeah, sorry about all that. You hear me clicking into the microphone that's the cough drop i'm sorry all right so time to wordpress all the things right this is the the primary reason why i wanted to bring this forward to everybody's attention now was to talk about this particular trap and this is for a very non-technical kind of an audience but when you are doing wordpress at the i won't call it the proper level right because there's a lot of different use cases for wordpress but when you're using wordpress for this kind of curated content it really really behooves you to take a step back from the two default content types that come with WordPress and to ask yourself questions about what is my content? Like what kind of things do I wanna put in this website and how do I make WordPress do that, right? That is the trap of the default WordPress content types. There are two, they remember what they're called? You'd say, you're all WordPress people, what are they called? Posts and pages, right? So. If I'm looking at Mr. the entry for Joe Carpenter there on the right, and I start breaking down those different things, I'm like, okay, well, clearly this is not a page, right? Like Joe Carpenter's information here is not a page. So if there's only two in WordPress, it's got to be what? It's got to be a post, right? But then you start like looking at that and be like, well, how do I, how do I capture like the hometown for Joe or like his degree, or like, how do I, you know, how do I separate the abstract from the impact statement, which comes later on the page? How do I do like, how do I get WordPress to like do those things? And the answer of course is, you know, do some development and make sure that we can extend WordPress to that. But the, the key takeaway here is to actually do that work, right? Don't just assume that the content that you're about to be, you wanna put online will meet the existing model for WordPress understand that WordPress at its core is extendable and really easily extendable. Like the tools and bits and pieces that I'll detail out here in just a second 
are exposed with some pretty easy to use code and actually some no code solutions are out there too to do all of this basically that makes all of this kind of data modeling stuff easy to do and an easy conversation to have with somebody that does WordPress development. So my background, I'm not a software engineer by trade. I do technical things, but I'm like an English major. I started doing dispatch. Sorry, I started doing WordPress as a 911 dis dispatcher for the city of Phoenix fire department. I learned to code on night shift to keep myself awake, <laughs> turned it into like a full-time job at some point. So that is my background and I can do this. So I can do it and you can too. Like I said, it's not, that's not super complicated, but you do have to think about things in terms of like a model, right? You have to actually take the time to understand, okay, what is it that I want to build and how do I want to represent it on the, on the web? This was not that conversation. <laughs> the conversation that we had was like a crazy whiteboard, like lines and arrows. It looked like the football team, you know, was running a screen and it's crazy. Um, and then when we kind of got down to it and simplified everything, that's what we wanted to build right there. <laughs> so there's two bits and pieces in the Forge website. There's a custom post type called a project and a custom post type called a participant. And those are the two entities that make up what is happening with our thing, right? There's a place to put the demographic data, the profile image, social media links, things like degree programs and graduation dates. And there is a relationship between that and the projects that this person has produced. And the reason that that relationship is important is because the way is because of the way that the event was structured, right? They, the same person could have more than one project represented in different semesters over the course of time. So they could do a project for another one program, come back in two semesters and present a sit in another project with a different mentor, the same person. So we wanted a way to sort of connect them together. So when you're doing that, that so the, the stuff in the box is the cut, you know, the, the actual things that we want to build. The stuff below the box are all the terms that we wanted to use to describe that thing. And when you start having that conversation with a developer, with a WordPress person in your life, right, they will start sort of giving you like the indication of what these things are called in WordPress. And again, this is not new to developers, probably not even new to most of the people in the room. I give this presentation also to people that don't know WordPress at all. So just be like, hey, there's a thing, there's a way to extend that. But um, just by show of hands, is this is familiar territory to most of you guys? Yeah, okay, good. So I won't dwell on what this is too much, but just to say that, these things have been around for a long time. <laughs> They're not going anywhere anytime soon. They are really sort of the entry level, you know, things to build when you're doing WordPress kind of information, but it is really a good idea to do that. Now, I will say that some of the fancy things that we did with this particular website, um, not even considering custom fields, but that relationship that we needed to build between those two post types is a tool that I want to highlight in the presentation because I think that it should be in core. It's that cool. <laughs> um, the other piece of the puzzle that I tell people about is I remember this diagram from yesteryear, <laughs> theme development like five years ago, right? This is the template hierarchy uh, uh, graphic. <laughs> I lived and breathed for a while when I was, you know, doing um, non-block theme development, right? Like old school stuff. I dropped this into the into the uh, presentation here too, not to say that you have to memorize this or even know about it or even know that it had this at one point. All of this to say that there is a bunch of stuff that is happening in WordPress core that does a lot of the work for you. <laughs> and if you call your thing the right way, <laughs> when you are making it, WordPress will know what to do with it in general terms. So it's not like you have to, it's not like you have to encode a whole big instruction booklet for how to deal with all of this stuff. Like WordPress will give you a ton of the resources available and a really good roadmap for like doing all of the things that we're asking it to do here. And again, for non-technical audiences and, and non-WordPress for people, that's sort of important to understand. Um, all right, so <clears throat> more diving into like, cool, what do we do? How do we do it? Um, this is what it looked like in 2017 after about three and a half weeks of development. I kind of took the branding that was in the print thing and made it on the web because I am not a designer. So I said, that looks great and I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, so you see, you know, the, the same kind of color coordination happening between the different projects, a very filterable kind of experience, not yet image forward. We did a lot of that stuff later on, but um, the basics were there, right? All of this information was there in the search page. You could click on the different projects and get to a, a page that actually looked like, um, much like what you see on the website today. So um, at that point, like three weeks into the project, I was like, cool, we did it. How do we make it better? Like, Because I knew 
I, it wasn't like a very like very heavily planned well executed giant massive project it was very organic i was like i know that, that there are going to be some issues coming up soon and i just planned on a bigger roadmap after the launch to just deal with a lot of them. some of those problems happen right away right so i built a website that represented one 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 ford <laughs> one expo um, and then I re immediately realized I have no idea how to get this information to change seamlessly when we do the next expo, right? There was a presentation of like, you know, however many projects were there in the first semester of it. And I needed a way to like click a button to do something to like change the word, you know, change the website from like one presentation to another. So like, there, there are some things that capture what is happening in the moment, but there are also other parts of this website that actually expose over, you know, history. So you can go back and look up something that happened to somebody five or six years ago but it also has a page that explorer page we looked at before that allows you to see like what happened at this expo because the, the whole point of it was to drive attendance to the actual event and make it a good digital experience for somebody that was either doing it online or you know sort of supplementing what was happening in person so we did um and and the way that we solved a lot of these problems was just by adding adding some little switches adding some little bells and whistles to different parts of wordpress to extend it to do the things we're asking it to do. So um, I'm like, I wouldn't be a developer unless I put some code on the screen. So if you code adverse, just blind your eyes for a second, it's gonna happen. But they, the solution to that, right, is querying by taxonomy data, which is an easy thing to do. You put a switch on the page that just said, is this the thing you wanna show, yes or no? And then when you write your query, you say, cool, go get me only those things that I have checked. <laughs> and that's it, right? The the actual courier for that symposium page I just showed you before had two things going on to it, and that's the reason why I put them on the screen. And I'm going to move this up here because I had a third thing that I didn't want to show you. So, um, all good there, yeah. So, code right. The the top arrow is that switch. Put a switch on the taxonomy item page. It just said display this yes or no. It's not switched. Queried out. It's gone. The second little line. PDP underscore type participants to projects. That is the one line of code that you need along with the plugin called post to post to make that relationship possible between the two uh, custom post types. Uh, has anybody used post to post like at all? Like I can see, yeah, yeah that's, uh, yeah, anybody, anybody else? That is such a cool thing that I really, I should do a whole presentation on just that. <laughs> it is a plugin that was written, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Um, that introduces to WordPress a code forward way to make a relationship possible between custom post type A and custom post type B. There are a bunch of different ways to do that now. Eight or nine years ago, there wasn't, there was one way. It was this way. It was post to post. Um, the plugin still exists in the repository. Another company besides the person that wrote it has sort of taken it over because it's in some of their legacy stuff. It is 100% viable. It works very, very well. If that whoever owns it right at the moment decides not to take it over, I am next in line because I love it and I think it's great. Um, again, posts to post. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's it's great. Uh, all right, back to stuff. All right, so we also had a data entry problem, right? I got the information like for the first Forge symposium handed to me on a CSV file because that was going to be fed into the print publication. It was like cool, just do some importing and some data massage and throw it into the throw it into WordPress. And then we were like, I don't really want to do typing for 120 projects and you know all of the people and all of the you know two custom post types per person per project. That's like a ton of data entry right there. So how do we do this? Like what do we do? We um we ended up making a post submission form, which is another way to sort of great way to extend WordPress. And that so when we make our students do it because they're slave labor at this point, right? <laughs> um, they they will submit to us the fact that they're going to be in this expo that will give us their name, their degree information, their project information, their abstract, their impact statement, a headshot, their social media links. They will submit it all to us in a packaged form. It goes through us, uh, you know, editing and, and uh, an approval process before we publish it on the website. But that is all made possible by things that extend WordPress again. So this is a form plugin. I'm not going to name drop because there's a bunch of them that do that right at the moment. If you want details, I will give them to you later. But just use something that is familiar to do this work and make sure that you're not doing it for, you know, that you're not putting yourself in that that place where you're totally responsible for the data entry, right? Um, 
we, you know, so we built this 2017, this thing called the block editor happened sometime in the middle of it. Um, I put the block editor changed a lot about the way that we do work again for really non-technical non-wordpress audiences but the key takeaway here is that backwards compatibility is a thing with wordpress and so i knew even though the block editor was going to happen that i could just sit and i could wait for it to be mature or i could decide not to use it at all like the the um the two custom post types that we have right at the moment are so classic editor old school word 2009 oriented fields and we, we still do that for that particular part of the site but pages and, and other parts of the website are actually built using blocks the same as we would. So we have built a bunch of extra blocks into our theme that does all of this. It actually takes some of the information, exposes it in different ways. We're using a bunch of them on the front page. So like all the sliders and carousels and the data oriented things you'll see on the, in the forged and engineering homepage, do all of that. Uh, I wanted to bring up that, that, it, that I knew that it would work. I knew that we had time. I knew that I didn't have to do it right away. I also did a whole thing. So, um, Tips and tricks for about using advanced custom fields blocks. A lot of the blocks that I featured in that talk that happened earlier this year in Phoenix came right from this project. So uh, more detail if you're interested in learning how to use ACF to do some fun things. Uh, plug in for me. <laughs> um, all right. So the other thing that happened, like the block editor happened and we dealt with it. The other thing that happened over that course of time was COVID, right? We had to transition our website away from like a a tool that we use to sort of supplement the event to the actual event. <laughs> like the Forge website was engineered well enough where we added a few more bells and whistles to it, like the little display conference link thing you see at the side. And in a very similar way, we're able to toggle on and off a big set of links that exposed sets of Zoom windows and Zoom you know, oriented discussion groups and things like that to completely make this website go from like a supplement to an in-person event to the actual event. Like there were uh, buttons that we were able to put on here and like join the event at this time and, you know, promoted it that way for as long as, as, as long as we needed to for, for that. Um, it, it, it happened again, like quick development cycles. That's the takeaway, the key, the key takeaway to talking about that is really WordPress again, can do a lot of this work very quickly. You don't have to spend a lot of time and energy. You can sort of, dance your way around problems as a developer it's actually kind of cool that you can that that the tools exist in that um in that space so and then the artwork you know eventually made its way into uh into what we built for the website featured students got their portraits taken and we exposed a lot of them on the front page we also started doing a lot more work with the faculty mentors and like the relationships between the students and the faculty uh, like happen on the site so you see a lot of good writing a lot of good um uh you know, interviews, questions and answers about the projects, about the different um, subjects that are being taught. And again, that's more, it's more custom blocks, it's more post meta, we sort of bolted on some features as we kind of got more ideas about, hey, let's do this, hey, let's do that. But again, the key takeaway is it's extendable, and you can do it at a very low cost. So it's not like super, um, I guess the, the real key takeaway is, it is okay to approach a project that does this in its scope, without having a formal plan or a formal footprint in front of you at the time that you do it. And I think as a developer, that was a really powerful realization that being like, hey, okay, I know that I could take 70% of the information and I'll figure out the rest along the way. Um, we tell good stories about our faculty and we move on. All right, so conclusions, right? Um, I wanted to bring this forward again, forge.engineering.asu.edu. If you're looking at it, like, great. Um, if you want to look at it later, I will totally go more in depth, but why? Like at the end of the day, I stepped forward and I said, let's do this whole digital thing. Let's not lose the information. And I was hoping to gain something from it. I was hoping to just maybe, maybe make sure that like none of it got lost. Cause it seemed, didn't, it seemed like not a good idea to like lose all of that information, right? It just wasn't a good idea. So we, we gained like a searchable archive showing the, the arc of student research over time. You can definitely see like the, the subject matters kind of come and go over topics. Like, so three years ago, it was less about machine learning and AI. It was definitely more about like the internet of things. It was more about like robotic arms and self-driving cars, which are still projects that are being pursued, but they weren't as heavily pursued as what they are now. So you can definitely see um, uh, arcs about what people are studying, uh, CRISPR, and uh, especially during the COVID phase where we were, everybody was researching the vaccine. 
uh, biomedical engineering is a thing. So we were all struggling with like how to do that. So all of our student research projects about that time, there's there's a boatload of them that actually feature on that subject and in its ancillary sort of problems. And it's really cool to be able to see that, right? They can do some research and understand that students are like really pushing the envelope forward so that when we give them that message at the end of it, it says, hey, the thing that you are making could actually change the world. We have a thing that we can actually show them that says, look, it happened, <laughs> right? This is what a student was researching seven years ago. And I can go back and tell them, hey, this student is currently working at Raytheon doing, you know, sending satellites into space. Like, you know, it works at SpaceX making, you know, the, you know, the, um, the uh, rockets come back down and land, you know, vertically again. Like, just really cool conversations stemming from this kind of uh, project, you know, coming forward. Um, and again, it's also a proof of concept within ASU, uh, a non-WordPress forward university that WordPress can actually do all of this. Like it is, it is a good tool to use to actually put this stuff together. As long as you're using it right and doing the things that we talked about before, it's work, it's fine. So uh, extendability, reliability, developer friendly, um, and uh, you know, don't get caught in that default content trap like in the beginning. Like that's the, the one key advice. That, <laughs> like if you are approaching this project in the right way, just make sure to have that data model in your hand. Um, all right, that was quick, a lot. Do we have questions about what we have? Melissa, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is like, uh, we had a form that students can drop in their information about their abstract and their impact statements and all that. They have to know what that is in order to get sponsored by a number of the projects to begin with. So a lot of these projects are funded, and so they have to do a research proposal before they come to this event and the research is completed. So they have a lot of that already in their back pocket. We spend some time on our end just making sure that, honestly, that students like put their names the right way, which is totally a thing. <laughs> um, that their degree program, like when they enter it into the field as an actual real life degree program and not one they just made up because they want to do something specific or new. Um, and, it, you know, we do a little bit of editing. I think that they have a lot of that information in their back pocket when they submit information to the form. So I don't think it's like a huge barrier to entry. Like <laughs> we, we monitor submissions to that form all the time. And we always have a joke that like, there's always going to be one that happens one minute before the forum closes. Like there's always one of the 120. We, we always have a joke like, is it two minutes, one minute or right on the nose? So does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, good question. So the two questions. Um, one, who is the intended audience of the site, right? Um, and then two, do we use the website for other bigger marketing purposes within ASU Engineering? Did I get that right? So the answer is like, uh, uh, like everybody and yes, like <laughs> a very short answer. Um, the the intended audience of our website is the general public. We do want to make sure that that this information does get exposed to people who are curious about ASU engineering and about what we do. Um, it is a resource that we point to a lot, but we don't go like a ton. We don't do like marketing campaigns against it. We do do a lot of social media to promote the fact that the, the event is happening. Um, so a lot of these images that you saw up here, a lot of fancy ones where people, students are engaged with their work or their mentors are doing something with them. We have a ton of artwork and a ton, like a big long trajectory of social media stuff that happens with with promoting this event and making sure that it's there. And of course, it does a really good job of telling that story about ASU engineering and who we are and why we do it. So I would say that there is a marketing purpose, but it's not like we're we're making a, like a, it's not like we built it to say, this would be a really good marketing tool, right? The, the purpose of it is to just preserve the information. And it happened that we invested a lot of time and energy as it grew organically into this thing that is a good marketing tool in addition to telling good stories and, and all of the other stuff that it does. Another good question. How long is the archive available for? It is available for as long as I can possibly keep the website running. <laughs> um, we started doing this in 2017. Uh, we have put every symposium that has happened between 2017 and 2024 in there. I think the total events is like 13 or 14. 
uh, the there is a fun little counter on the bottom of it that tells you the total number of projects that then there. I think it's I'll say it's like in the neighborhood of like 3,000, 4,000 projects now. So a, a good swath of time <laughs> um, about what is happening with student research. And uh, and yeah, like there's we, we don't have any we don't have any like uh, I don't see a need and I don't really have a desire to like sort of purge old projects out. I want it to be like an ongoing growing. I also understand that that has some logistical problems associated with hosting, you know, all the media files that are in there or whatever, but we'll pay more for it, I guess. <laughs> we don't mind. It's fine. It's, it's, it's worth the cost. Go ahead. For sure. So that that question was mostly, you know, reiteration of something that I said before about who the intended audience was, and really making sure that I acknowledge the fact that there are other audiences besides just the general public. One of which you mentioned, definitely, um, we have had opportunities to have uh, industry in particular come in and sponsor a bunch of different projects that are related to their um, to their research in particular, like with Arizona and a bunch of other states chasing all of the microchip money that is coming down the pipeline from the national government right at the moment. We've had a bunch of semiconductor people that have come in and sponsored projects. We have also, like in, in the um, uh, COVID days when biomedical research was a thing, we had a bunch of sponsored projects then that were in that particular space. So yes, Definitely a, a good connection with industry saying, hey, we're also we're building a pipeline for you. We're building engineers that know all of these things already coming out. Like we want you to be involved so that the things that they are working on when they're in school match the things that they're going to work on when they're leaving school, right? That, that we want to make that transition for our students as seamless as we can between, you know, the what's possible and what is actually being done on the real world. So yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Sure. So the question is um, more is in the SEO realm, and I I'm going to be totally frank. I, I understood maybe half of what you said. So, <laughs> but um, in terms of like the SEO value that the website actually brings, is there value to is there value that we are seeing back from the analytics side about connecting the personal profiles and the journey that we are to you know that story that we're telling with the students as they kind of go through their research project and telling those stories at a personal level? Do we see uh, an increased SEO value in people that are actually trying to make a connection with people, right? Um, that personalized marketing and and uh, some of that. We we do a little bit of that. I would say that the connections that we make are definitely happening in the social media realm um, rather than organic search and traffic. We, we don't tend to do a lot of marketing that you know, sort of personalizes your experience based on the stuff that you want to know or see. It definitely is possible with the information, how we have it structured in there. So if I wanted to go and, you know, incorporate some of those tools as, you know, AB tools or, you know, whatever personalization tools that are out there for sure, I would have the data to do it. I know that I would like to say, okay, like I, if I'm a biomedical engineer and I put my major in there, I could change the whole front page to show me nothing but biomedical stuff if I wanted to, or, you know, engage in, in something that was interesting to me as opposed to just the more general. We haven't done a lot of that. Um, we want to be fair to everybody, like sort of, and, but also we we um, we like the exposure of all of the different things of engineering because of the interrelatedness and the interconnection between the different students and the projects that are doing. That's kind of the point of the the symposium, right? We get all of the people together in the same room at the same time to not only like tell us about their project. Like I I learned a ton just by walking in the door. I feel dumb walking in the door <laughs> um, because they're you know, they're just researching so many things that are so in depth, right? But at the same time, they get a chance to talk to each other and they get a chance to understand that the thing that they're doing with the machine learning and artificial intelligence over here is going to drive what is happening with self-driving cars or is going to drive what's happening in different, you know, different places. Um, 
So it's it, it's it's about the connection between the different projects and the people. And that's why we like the sort of overall exposure of the website to just sort of tell everybody a little bit of uh, about everything. Like, but to answer your question, yes, we could go there if we needed to. You got a question? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question was plugins that help me do this in terms of um, functionality and in terms of automation. Um, so uh, I will just plug post to post one more time. Like it is so good, it should be in core. <laughs> there needs to be a, a way in core to actually make that relationship happen at its, at its fundamental level because otherwise you have to do that yourself. And all of the queries that underscore WordPress like if you want to put both of those pieces of information on the page at the same time, you wind up doing some really expensive sort of query this and then query that based on the results of that and it comes back. But the great thing about post to post is with that one line of code and the plugin installed, it makes the relationship for you. It does it in the very old school database way of making a junction table between the two things that you want to relate it to each other. And so you can very quickly get at point A to point B with that one line of code that just says, give me everything you got here and also give me everything that's related you know, to that one thing over here. Um, so post to post is great. Other uh, processes for automation for sure that um, uh, the form extension that makes the um, uh, that makes that data entry stuff possible is was a huge time saver. We 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 I would say actually I probably spent more time solidifying that form than I did building a lot of the other parts of the website because we didn't want to do data entry. <laughs> but we also had to do like a big education campaign around like students to make sure that as a part of the process that we're getting like exposure to the to what that form looked like and why they needed to do it and how important it was. Um, that form at its core also does some automation stuff to like make a draft of the connection between the post or between the participate and the project. Happen. It does a lot of that stuff for you behind the scenes. Um, it, it captures all the information, but also does all the posty things. Like it assigns different things to taxonomies. It you know puts all the post meta in there, uploads a featured image, does all of that stuff. So a high degree of automation in that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. There's really not like it's it's all, like other than than that. Maybe we don't do a ton of like automated work that's in here. It's more of just like here's some information and then. You know, those those bells and whistles that we have in there, I guess, could be termed automation. It's really just about getting a, you know, getting the right switches in place so I can very quickly go into like three taxonomy terms, cook off, you know, don't include this in a bunch of the search results, find three more, click them on, and then the website is engineered the right way to just know what those taxonomy terms and limit a bunch of the pages to expose just the things that are in that year or just the things that are in whatever those terms are, right? Um, and then, you know, we also have places on the website that do expose the archive, you know, all the archive pages, all of the, you know, term pages for all the years we have. We do a lot of that. So does that help? Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. One more. I'm liking the questions, by the way. That's awesome. <laughs> Go ahead. I will. Yes. Slide is... Yeah, you're welcome. Links.asu.edu slash WP Phoenix 2024. Um, uh, so the question, so one was put that slide on the screen. <laughs> the other question was, do I notice any performance problems with um, with having information archived in the back um, in the back of the website sort of that many that many things in it, right? You know, with with as many things as we have, you know, three, you know, the, the combination of between three thousand and four thousand students and projects, or whatever, whatever the term, you know, wherever the number is, um, there are some performance things to consider. Like, I don't have a page on this website that says "cool list all of the projects." <laughs> like, we just don't do that because you know, a it wouldn't be useful to somebody, and then b it's, you know, performance reasons to kind of prevent you from doing that. We've also done a lot with the presentation layer of this to sort of like, if I'm giving you an archive of something, it is not in the fancy card form that you see presented on the homepage a lot where, you know, it just takes forever to scroll down and three up cards for a mile. 
it's in a like a table, like um, data tables is a, is, is a JavaScript piece that we have active on a lot of our archive pages that allow you to like sort of scan it into a table or called search for stuff like right there in the beginning. It's a useful JavaScript kind of a thing that we installed on a lot of our archive pages to help overcome that. So I'm not, you know, so the pages that do load data that have a lot of things to expose aren't doing it in like a giant. Yeah, you're welcome. 